Chapter 10 Pretty Girlfriend It was a hot day near the end of the school year, and Bradley's chest and arms were sore from lifting weights in P.E. class. His legs ached from tumbling practice on the hard mats in the gymnastics gym. He was used to being sore from the workouts, which was a sacrifice he made to be more like Superman. But today he was just super stiff, like an old man. It was noisy in the Wilson Junior High School cafeteria. He looked down at the lukewarm spaghetti and green beans on his tray, accompanied by a stale bread roll and a cup of apple juice. I wonder what Superman eats anyway. Still, he was hungry, and it wasn't any worse than the food at home. Stabbing at the spaghetti with a fork, he dug in. Out of nowhere came a sharp thump on his chest, and someone's steel fork clattered on his tray right into his food. He looked up. A couple of tables over, a black kid he knew to be Pinky, and a couple of his friends were sitting and grinning at him. Bradley felt his whole body tighten and his face get hot. Without thinking, he threw the fork back hard, hitting Pinky in the same spot on his chest where Bradley was now stinging in pain. The kid said something to his friends, picked up his food, and left. That was easy. Fair was fair, and it was over. The problem was that Pinky was a young gangster, and a lot of bad kids looked up to him. Nobody messed with Pinky. He was little, but he had a lot of bigger friends, and he always got his way. After Bradley finished his lunch, he hoisted his book bag over his shoulder and made his way toward the outer door. At the bottom of the steps, they were waiting, four of them. With a little spaghetti sauce stain on his shirt, Pinky said, We gonna whip your ass, motherfucker. Two of the boys were as big as grown-ups, and one of them was the top weightlifter in P.E. As they closed in, Bradley spun around, holding his bag in a strong right hand, ready to swing it. They might beat him up but one of them was going to get a lump on the side of his head after these books knocked him out. Then, something came over him. This was all wrong. These weren't like the villain Superman would hurt. They were just kids in the cafeteria. Come on, guys, don't do this. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have thrown that fork back. I know you were just kidding around. Let's drop it, okay? They stopped and looked very confused, their eyes darting between the book bag and Brad's face like they might change their minds. Nah. Pinky said, we gonna show you some shit, white boy. Out of nowhere appeared a girl in a ruffled yellow dress and tan patent leather shoes. Get away from him, y'all. You don't need to do this. Get your butts to class. I'm gonna tell your mamas if you do this. Come on, y'all. We're gonna take care of this business later, said Pinky with a scowl, taking a step back. I heard that, Pinky. No, you're not. Don't you dare, the girl said. When it was clear that the conflict was over, she flashed a quick smile at Bradley. It was Sydney, pretty Sydney. He knew her. Everybody in school did. She was funny and smart, but most of all kind. When Sydney turned to walk away, Bradley spoke up. Thank you, he said to her back as she departed as quickly as she could, not hearing a word he said. His system, wired up on adrenaline and her beauty, made his heart beat as if it might jump right out of his body. Bradley and Sydney had met earlier in the school year when they took the same way home each day. She was friendly with everyone, so when she said, Hi, to Bradley every afternoon on their way home, it was no big deal for her. But it was always a big deal to him. They'd walk together for several blocks, Sydney usually doing all the talking until she had to go one way and Bradley the other. Bradley loved looking at her and listening to her musical voice. She looked like a dream in whichever dress she wore. They were always yellow or pink. Her dark, flashing eyes would look into his and scan over his body. Once, she asked him what he thought of her hair, which her mother put into cornrows and braids. Another time, he got close enough to catch the scent of her flowery girl shampoo. It made him dizzy. In 1970, there was one big problem for Bradley and Sydney. She was black, but that didn't matter to the two of them, and they began to hold hands on their way home from school. But they had to be careful, so before they joined hands, they would walk a few blocks from the school first. One day, some punks in a passing car yelled at them. They pretended it didn't happen, which seemed like the best thing to do. And as the days went by, they talked about meeting each other's mothers. It was a Friday afternoon when Sydney walked all the way home with Bradley and met his mother. They hit it off right away, Natalie giving her some juice and a couple of cookies. They enjoyed some girl talk for a while, and Bradley was proud that his mother liked Sydney. Not long after that, before Bradley could meet Sydney's mother, some punks drove by, maybe the same ones as before. They were yelling and using the N-word. As they passed, Bradley felt something whiz by his face, and Sydney cried out. He looked to see what was wrong. There was a gash in her cheek. Something had hit her. The car had slowed down, and the punks were laughing. He ran at them, wanting to destroy them, not caring if they killed him for trying. 
As the car sped away with laser focus, he memorized the license plate number. Bradley tore off a piece of his shirt and pressed it up against Sydney's wound. She was crying, blood running down her cheek. I'm sorry, Sydney. It's my fault. She choked back the sob. No, it's not. You didn't throw that thing at me. It's my fault. Because those punks are white like me. The words came out in a low growl. It don't matter what color anybody is. There's just some people who are going to need God's forgiveness more than others. She had a big heart. Her words stayed with Bradley for a long time and made him hope he would always have God's forgiveness. But those bastards needed to pay. For weeks, Bradley looked at license plates on car bumpers, wanting to destroy the car that hurt Sydney. But he never found it. The only thing that made sense, the only thing he could think of that would help, was for him to stop seeing Sydney. He couldn't imagine causing her to get hurt again. As hard as it was for him, at school he pretended he didn't know her, and after class he took a different way home. After Sydney got hurt, Bradley told people to call me Brad. He was starting to forget the sound of her beautiful sing-song voice trilling, Bradley, Bradley. But he would never forget that she was his first girlfriend. That summer was hot and dry in the afternoons, but mornings and evenings were perfect for delivering papers. Mo was between jobs again, so Brad helped pay the rent and buy food. Fortunately, they didn't run out of food too often since Natalie had qualified for food stamps. All in all, except for noisy buses and diesel fumes and a few drunken scenes, the growing Rosedale family lived comfortably enough on Allen Avenue until Brad started high school.